I want to label the message with the point of the message. I can state it in four words. It pays to give. It pays to give. People have different reasons for going to church. Some godly, some trivial, some just plain wrong. But of the various reasons people have for going to church, good, bad, or indifferent, you rarely hear someone say, I can't wait to get to church Sunday to give an offering. But I stand to say that should be your attitude. You should look forward to every opportunity you get to give back to God. And here is why. It pays to give. This is the message of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 record Paul's appeal to the saints in Corinth to help the needy saints in Jerusalem. It is the fullest mention of Christian generosity in the New Testament. Fundamentally, these two chapters are about money, but Paul never actually uses that term. He uses spiritual language to refer to material possessions. And Paul does not exercise his apostolic authority to command the saints to give. Instead, he lays before them spiritual motivation for generous giving. And our text is one of the primary motivations why Christian people should be generous people. Paul teaches us here that it pays to give. This is one of those paradoxical principles of Christian discipleship. We live by dying. We lead by serving. And we receive by giving. It pays to give. But if you only give because it pays, it will not pay. Do you remember the name Jim Baker? Jim Baker was a famous televangelist who was an early advocate for prosperity theology. But after the downfall of his praise the Lord empire, which resulted to a period for him in jail, he wrote his autobiography. I bought it, didn't read it. I bought it just for the title. He simply labeled his story with these three words, I was wrong. And I contend that anyone is wrong who would have you think that it is God's will for every Christian to be rich. Christianity is about infinitely more than what is in your bank account. Yet at the same time, your Christian stewardship and more particularly your financial generosity is an objective indicator of your true spiritual devotion. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus says it this way, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When you invest your treasure in the things of God, you will never go unrewarded. It pays to give. Paul makes that point here in these three verses where we see the principle, practice, and promise of Christian generosity. Let me walk you through it. First, consider with me the principle of Christian generosity. After the flood of Noah, 
God established what is called the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest is stated in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, where God says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This law governs the physical world around us and the spiritual world beyond us. Paul uses this law of the harvest to describe the spiritual world around us in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where he declares, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Whoever sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but whoever sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Paul directly applies the principle of the harvest to how we give. We see it in the larger context of that passage. In Galatians 6, verse 6, Paul says that the one who is instructed in the word should share every good thing with the one who teaches. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, So therefore, as you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. But in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Paul adds a layer to the principle of the harvest. Listen to him. Not only do you reap what you sow, but here Paul claims you reap more than what you sow. Look at verse 6 of our text. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Picture the scene. Early in the morning, the farmer goes into his barn to get seed to sow. He has a decision to make, but it's no real decision. He gathers as much seed as possible to plant. The farmer has no guarantees about the future. As the rich man in Luke chapter 12, verse 16, the ground may reap plentifully for him or the direct opposite may happen. The field may fail to yield fruit. There may be a famine in the land. The devourer may eat his harvest, but these do not become excuses for the farmer to hold on to as much seed as possible just in case. Even though he has no guarantees, the farmer sows as much seed as he can afford. He, he doesn't hold back seed concerned about the possibility that the harvest may not come. No, he plants seed with expectation of what God may do on his behalf. And so because he has confidence in God, he sows bountifully because in his mind and heart, this is an opportunity he cannot afford to miss. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, this is what Paul is saying about giving. Your attitude toward giving should be this. Giving is an opportunity you can't afford to miss. Notice the tension of verse 6. The tension of verse 6 is not whether you should give something versus nothing. The possibility that a Christian would give nothing is not even suggested in the text. The issue here is how much will you give back to God? You can give 
sparingly and reap sparingly, or you can give bountifully and reap bountifully. The text here then, hang in there with me for a moment. The text here then indicates that there is a sense in which God permits you to help determine how much he'll bless you. Of course, we can't dictate how God will work in our lives. God is God, and we are not. But the verse inevitably here says that we receive sparingly or bountifully from God on the basis of what we give to God. In a real sense, God permits us to participate in the process of how he will bless us. So when a member comes to me and needs advice asking, Pastor, what should I tithe on, my net or my gross? I answer with a question, which one do you want God to bless, the net or the gross? We participate in determining how God will bless us by how we handle the material possessions he entrusts to us. Therefore, the text is challenging us to give generously, proportionately, and sacrificially. If you're taking notes, jot down Proverbs chapter 11, verses 25 and 24 and 25. Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Or here's another verse, Malachi 3 and 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And prove me now, says the Lord. I love that verse. It's the only verse, Malachi 3 and 10, where God says, test me. Every other place God says, I'm God, you not. Don't test me. But when it comes to finances, God says, you want to know if I'm real? Test me. Prove me. Try me. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will have no more need. Luke 6 verse 38 says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together running over, will men put into your bosom? For with the same measure you measure out, it will be measured back to you. This is the principle of Christian generosity. Let me say it the way they used to sing it when I was a boy. You can't beat God giving. No matter how hard you try. Now, this is no get rich quick scheme. Just continue with the picture of the farmer in verse 6. The farmer does not scatter the seed, claim a blessing, and then go back to the house with a harvest in hand. He must labor and trust and wait. But the assurance is this, if the farmer does all he can do, God steps in to do all he cannot do. And this is how God works in the lives of those that are generous. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, jot that down. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all of your produce, and your barn will be filled to overflowing, and your vat will brim over with wine. Church, you can't be God giving. God will never let you be more generous to him than he is to you. 
There was a farmer that gave generously, even though his field was no bigger or better than his neighbors, and they wanted to know, how is it that you always have something to give? He says, simply, that I, I keep shoveling into God's bin, and the more I shovel into God's bin, the more God shovels into my bin, and God's got a bigger shovel than me. <laughs> Are y'all in here with me? There is the principle of Christian generosity in verse 6. Would you drop down to verse 7 and consider with me the practice of Christian generosity, the practice of Christian generosity. Verse 7 says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The first thing you should note out of verse 7 is that it teaches us every Christian has a personal responsibility to give, whether rich or poor or even in debt. No one is exempt from verse 7. Note the first four words of the verse, each one must give. The rest of the verse emphasizes the practice of Christian generosity without mentioning how much your gift should be. The point is, God is not, notice verse 7, this is the bottom line of it. God is not looking at what you give as much as he is looking at how you give. No matter how much money you put in an envelope, it is not pleasing to God unless you give intentionally, willingly, and joyfully. That's all in verse 7. Give intentionally. Verse 7 says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. The Greek word there translated decided simply means to choose beforehand. It's only used here in all of the New Testament. It, it means to purpose to do a thing or not do a thing. And Paul uses the word here to say this is how you should give, as you decide, as you determine beforehand, as you choose. That is, your giving ought to be intentional. Before Sunday comes, you ought to pre-plan what you are going to give to God. Some of y'all crack me up. Because we have an offering every Sunday, and every Sunday you act shocked at the offering. Oh, Lord, it's offering today. Oh, my goodness. You, you, you act shocked every week. <laughs> like you didn't know the offering was coming. Oh, man, if I would have known, I would have brought something to give. But, but Paul is saying here that in anticipation that you are going to worship God, you, you ought to intentionally lay something aside so that when you come to worship, your gift is not thoughtless, emotional, or leftover. That's what we do. We spend all our money on what we need and on what we don't need. And then we come to church with our favorite theology. God understands. This is all I got left. But that's not God's fault. He gave you what you started with. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 says, On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as the Lord has prospered you. This is how you ought to give intentionally. You ought to lay something aside for God and then store it up. It ought to be reserved for God in keeping with how the Lord has prospered you. Give intentionally. And then the text says give willingly. The promise of Christian generosity. God the Father is mentioned twice in this passage. In verse 7, 
The love of God is connected to our giving. God loves what kind of giver? But in verse 8, the power of God is connected to our giving. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. All grace. Listen to what he's saying. Listen, there are different kinds of grace. And God is the source of it all. 1 Peter 5 and 10 says he's the God of all grace. The grace of God saves. The grace of God sanctifies. The grace of God strengthens. The grace of God sustains. But here in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, he's saying something else. The grace of God supplies what you need. You missed it? Let me try it one more time. Grace doesn't just get you to heaven. Grace takes care of you every day on the way to heaven. Grace, grace puts food on the table. Grace puts clothes on your back. Grace keeps a roof. You thought you got it because you worked so hard. You saved so well and you planned so wisely, but it's grace. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give favor and honor, and no good thing will he withhold from the one who walks up rightly. This is the promise of Christian generosity. God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may have, be able to abound in every good work. Notice the extent and intent of God's sovereign grace in our lives. Verse 8 says, God is able. Just stop right there for a moment. Let that marinate. God is able. Able just means he can do it. He can do what? He can do whatever he determines to do. God is not somebody who talks one thing and can't pull off what he says. God has the power to do whatever he determines to do. Vance Havner says, this is the victory that overcomes the world when we are shipwrecked on God and stranded on omnipotence. God is able to do whatever you need him to do. The Bible says in Acts 20 verse 32, he is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. Ephesians 3 and 20 says he's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you ask or think. Jude verse 24 says he is able to keep you from stumbling. And here, Paul says God is able to make all grace abound to you. The word abound means to overflow, to go over the edges and boundaries and limits. The word used in John 10 and 10 where God says, I'll give you life and life more abundantly. God can make grace abound towards you. Just lean into this verse with me for a minute. I hope you'll be friends with it after the day is over. He, he, he made, he's able to make grace abound. What kind of grace? All grace. Whatever grace you need, he can make your cup overflow. Notice the superlatives and and inclusive statements here. You will have all grace abound towards you so that you will have He says, all sufficiency. Sufficiency just means to have enough, to have everything you need. God says, if you trust me, I'll make sure you have everything that you need. I got the wrong crowd here today. Let me try it again. God says, if you just trust me, I'll make sure you have everything 
that you need. Now, now, now I know why some of y'all are, are, are not excited about that. And, and let me be clear. God, in Philippians 4, verse 19, Philippians 4, verse 19 says, my God shall supply your needs, not your greeds. So don't get mad if you don't get everything you want. It's a sorry parent that overindulges the children and always grant their whims, desires, and fantasies. You don't raise responsible children by granting every request. You raise overly mature brats who think they are entitled to whatever they want in the world. And God wants you to be mature and sometimes to help you grow up. He says, no. I'm about to shout right now all by myself because because I'm I'm having flashbacks over my life over things that I wanted so bad that I, Lord I just ain't gonna make it if you don't give me this if you don't do that but now I can look back over my life hear me now and, and I don't just thank God for open doors I thank God for closed doors y'all ain't in here with me that's cool, I'll shout by myself there. I'd be living in the wrong city, pastor in the wrong church, married to the wrong woman if God gave me everything that I wanted. Thank God for no! I'm, I'm growing up enough, and I'm just glad to have my needs met. Some of y'all are going to have to leave here and pass people sleeping under the freeways. And you mad because you ain't got everything. I, for, for, forget steak. Did you have food last night? For, forget name brand clothes. Did you got something to put on? Forget gated community. You got somewhere to sleep tonight? Forget the name on the hood. Do you got a way home? Help me hear somebody. I'm trying to tell you, God's been good to you. We praise God for new life. We praise God for new jobs. We praise God for relationships. But no matter why you praise, let's praise God together. Join the Shiloh Church in Orange Park. We are now one church in two locations. Sunday morning service in Orange Park starts at 9.15 a.m. beginning January 4th. You can find us on the corner of Blanding and College Drive. We are saving a seat for you. Visit us online at shiloh.church.